Our guest for this morning, Dr. Tuchu. Toby? Tochi Okwa. Tochi Okwa. So close here. for you. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let, let, let's first start with, before I tell people what Ebola is, let's first agree, yeah. because that is a very contentious issue. So, must we stop eating bush meat just to, not to get inve infected with Ebola? Um, I would have to bust your bubble. Um, since you've come out directly to ask the question, I'll give you a direct answer. I think so. But then we'll explain as we go on. You think so? Oh, yes. No more bush meat? No. No more bush meat, the way you've put it. But then as we go along, you, you understand why, to us why we you need may to just have to step, step down, down on, on your bush meat. I yes. like that. You're just stepping down. It's not, I mean, like, um, uh, not like abandoning it. I'll leave that decision <laughs> to you when we get there. All right, so tell me. <laughs> Tochi, what is Ebola? Um, what, is, what is the Ebola virus that everybody is so scared of? Uh, well, like you rightly said, Ebola virus is, is a virus, but then it's the class of virus we call the filovirus. And um, at the risk of getting too technical, I'll say it's the class of viruses we say are RNA viruses. But meaning then RNA, the strand that they contain, you would okay. either have a single strand or a double strand. The single strand is the RNA, the double strand is the DNA. But I think um, that's just okay for the public okay. as it is. But Ebola virus is important because it is one of those viruses that cause what we call the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Viral hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic fevers. fevers, yes. And um, for the Ebola virus, it was first identified in 1976. There yeah, were, sim about, yes. yeah, there were about 1970s actually. There were simultaneous outbreaks of um, the Ebo e then it was called Ebola hemorrhagic fever, but now it's called the Ebola virus disease. Okay. Then one was found in um, in Sudan. Yes. And then another in in, in no no no. South so African Republic. No, Democratic Republic of Congo, then Zaye, wow. in one Yambuktu village. And that was where the name Ebola came from, because there was an Ebola river in the village. So that was how the name Ebola, Ebola virus came. I see. But then eventually, you know, they started identifying other subspecies of the virus. Okay. So currently, there are about five subspecies of the virus, but only four are known to cause diseases in humans. The Ebola Zaye, you have the Ebola Sudan, the Ebola Thai, and then the Ebola Bunginguya, it's, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> so those are the four. And the current one that is found to be causing disease so now is. in Guinea and Liberia is actually the Ebola Zaye. Okay. Yes. Now, we have, we have identified it with the, the source name, which is, okay, you know, the somewhere Ebola, it's ESCR, yeah. okay. Now, but is it an African thing? Is it that uh, the virus is now found a niche in Africa? It doesn't go outside of Africa? Is that what, is that what we have discovered? Mm, yeah, you can basically say for the human disease. Remember, I told you there are five subspecies. Um, there's actually the Ebola resting. This one occurs more in the Philippines and in China. But what has been found is that it causes disease more in the primates and in apes and chimpanzees. But well, it does not get into humans? It does. It causes disease in humans, but it's not as fatal okay. as the Ebola we have around here. Okay. And the Ebola virus we have here now causing disease, it has what we call a case fatality rate of 90%. It could get up to 90%, meaning that if 10 people come down with, with the virus, with the, virus the chances them, are that nine of them may die. That's why it's said to have a very high case fatality rate. Now, um, because we need to come back to this idea of why you must not do this or oh, not yeah. do that. So, so how, how, how does it now get to humans? Because it's like it's, it, it's with the animals now, with the apes, with the monkeys. Mm -hmm. and all. So mm -hmm. how did it get into, into humans? Um, the, there are two aspects to the transmission. We are talking about what we call transmission now. In other words, how the disease gets to humans. The... It's not yet clear exactly how it gets from the wild into so human this, population, yes. but what is known, according to available evidence, is that what we call the fruit bat. It's a bat, fruit bat, it has its home around Africa, but then if you look at the way it goes around the map, it goes from Africa 
to down to South Africa and stretches down like that and comes. So that's like the area of coverage of the fruit bat. Then it's known to be like the reservoir of um, that virus. All right. And then somehow it gets to infect animals in the wild around the rainforest. It gets to infect um, the primates, especially the apes, the chimpanzees. The monkeys. Sometimes, yeah, the monkeys, sometimes antelopes and then porcupines, perhaps. And, and we eat a lot of porcupines and antelopes. Yes, so when one man gets in contact with the body fluids or the fish, it could be this, or the flesh, it could be the saliva, whatever, of ill or dead animals, then that way is not imported into the human, the human population, where human to human transmission then now begins. Continues. Yes, now continues. So you see, when hunters around the rainforest go hunting, naturally a weak animal, an ill animal, you would imagine, will then um, be easy to catch. We attract, I mean, easily yes. attract the hunter. It will easily attract the hunter and it will not necessarily be able to outrun the hunter the way it would normally. And then sometimes some people go hunting, you know there's a lot of poverty, who go hunting and pick up dead animals and then bring it into the human population. And during the process of the cleaning of the meat the and fluids. the processing and all that, human beings then come in contact with the fluids of these um, animals and then they infect human beings. And what then happens is that there's what we call incubation period. The incubation period is between 2 to 21 days. The virus right. can stay in the human body for, for up to 21 days. Yeah. Without before, doing anything? No, without doing anything. 14 to 21 days thereabout. Before it then, you know, it has to replicate. Manifests. Remember, okay. the, it has to replicate. And Inside you know what viruses body. do? Yes, the viruses now comes and then gets into the body and then replicates multiplies and then causes the disease and from one human to the other now the transmission begins and because of the nature of transmission it has to be by close contact with the same body fluids saliva blood semen all that so you can imagine that you can now understand that the Immediate transmission will start with family members. Yes. Because there will naturally be the people that will take care of a sick person. First. First. But then there's also a unique part of this transmission. When people get sick, they go to health facilities. So what happens to doctors yes, like you and exactly. nurses? Yes, exactly. It's an occupational hazard. So it then goes to the hospital facility. And then you notice what we call amplification around hospital facilities. Because from there, hospital facility... There will be soil leaning, people still coming in contact with um, more of the fluids. And I think at this point I should uh, mention what um, the symptoms of infection yeah, with like. of the Ebola virus disease. There will usually be a very sudden onset fever. The temperature goes High temperature. Yes, the temperature goes Suddenly. up. Sudden onset. All right. The temperature goes up. And then there's extreme weakness. There's muscle pain joint pains and then the person may start vomiting feeling nauseous vomiting and then as it progresses further you may have rashes redness of the eye and even internal or external bleeding. bleeding and if you take blood to the lab you may observe that what we call the white cell count is low and also what we call the platelet count is um, also low so you can imagine that sort of person in a health facility and these are very, what we call, non-specific symptoms. I may mm, well have described malaria for yes. you now. <laughs> I may well have described meningitis yes. or even typhoid fever. So unless a health facility has a high index of suspicion, There's no way you, you may just treat that case as malaria. And then hospital staff come in contact with, with those body fluids and then the infection continues. And you'll actually notice the current infection in Guinea, there are, about, I think, about 25 health um, workers Already, out of yes. about cases of 228 cases. Yes, yes. What's the percentage of health worker to the entire population? Mm. To say that for 228 cases, 25 Already as our 25th of April, we are health workers. That would, that would explain this clustering around um, health, health facilities, facilities that, um, that I've explained. So that's how it is. No, but, but you see, what, that, mm. that, that frightens me a bit. Uh, between our own environment where yeah. we don't seem to have our hands on 
the, the quality of no, not just the service delivery, but yeah. even of taking care of the personnel. So what are we saying here? Um, what we're saying is, um, like I've mentioned before, every health worker who is trained mm. should be aware of what is going on, both locally and internationally, all right? And observe what we call universal precautions. Which require all right? that you do once? Um, which require that at every point in time, there are basic minimum standards you must maintain. that you must maintain. All right? More so now that you know, there's a possibility, even though we can't quantify how much of a possibility it is, but your risk assessment should be an ongoing thing and very, very up to date. But then what it means is that every healthcare facility that's taking care of an ill person must wear protective gloves, yes. must wear gloves. And then depending on the, like I've said, the way you have access, assessed the risk of whatever it is you're doing, goggles and face masks, masks and all those things, and then gowns that are spill proof. Spill? Spill proof. proof. How many facilities do you think we have that in Nigeria? Mm. <laughs>